guys are here joining us today for the COVID-19 past, present, and future strategies to mitigate its impact on education and psychosocial development of students. With us today, we have our panel of experts as well as our moderator, Dr. Sahil Rowe. Dr. Sahil Rowe is an Executive Vice President, DHR Health and President and CEO. DHR Health Institute for Research and Development. He served as the principal investigator of numerous studies funded by National Institutes of Health and Biopharmaceutical Industry. He did his MD from Dow University of Health Sciences, his MA from Boston University School of Medicine, his Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford University, and his fellowship from Harvard University. Dr. Rowe is an experienced immunologist with more than 150 peer-reviewed publications and numerous book chapters. He currently holds the position of professor at Texas A&M University and the University of Houston. He has over four decades of experience in leading research at various academic and non-academic institutions in the United States. He is currently serving as a site principal investigator of an NIH-funded study and is leading numerous extramurally funded innovative clinical trials, including service as the principal investigator of the Master Biobank Protocol at DHR Institute of Research and Development. As president and CEO of DHR Institute of Research and Development, Dr. Rowe has played a key role in the establishment of this entity in the Rio Grande Valley and in forging partnerships with academic and non-academic institutions and commercial entities to enhance clinical research in this region. Prior to joining DHR Institute of Research and Development, he served as the Chief Academic Officer at Christus Health, and prior to that, he served as the System Vice President for Research at Oshner Health System and Deputy Head of University of Queensland's Osher School of Medicine. In both organizations, he spearheaded the establishment of comprehensive research capacity with long-term strategic plans for the sustainability and continuous growth. Dr. Rowe has had numerous grants funded by private institutions as well as serving as the principal investigator for a training grant to promote the interest of minority students in research. In addition to Dr. Rowe's involvement in leading research entities in the United States, he has also served as an advisor to establish re research entities in various academic institutions in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Please help me welcome Dr. Sahil Rowe. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, before we actually start and I introduce the uh, expert panel here, I would like you to join with the rest of Texas and the nation in mourning the lives that are lost in the tragic events in Uvalde yesterday. Let us observe a moment of silence to show our support for the victims, the families, the healthcare workers, the first responders, the educators, and students affected by the shooting. Please join me in observing a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Jacqueline Harden for actually uh, the regional sc school-based nurse for Region 1 for coming up with this idea of how we can actually educate and share uh, some of the uh, important uh, aspects of COVID-19, particularly uh, how the students are going to uh, manage their summer break, and more importantly, have a face-to-face 100% -face schooling in the next academic year. I would also like to thank two of my colleagues, Melissa Eddy, who is the program manager, and uh, Sochi Lopez, for helping me in putting this together along with Jacqueline. And last but not the least, Dr. Daniel King, the Executive Director of Region 1, who was instrumental and supportive of uh, helping us put this uh, forum together for you. Now let me introduce uh, some of the experts here. 
Um, let me start with uh, Dr. Ricardo uh, Garcia. Dr. Ricardo Garcia is head of our infectious disease at DHR Health. Uh, he has played an instrumental role in COVID-19 um, pandemic that hit the region and has, play, has been an uh, investigator on many of the clinical trials that we have conducted here in the region for our community. In fact, the first plasma trial in which we actually uh, treated over 4,000 patients across 11 hospitals, uh, he was one of the instrumental investigators in that particular trial. Um, next, we have Dr. Ivan Melendez. Okay. The next is Dr. Ivan Melendez. He's the local uh, health authority for Hidalgo County. Uh, his uh, resume is so long that I have actually elected to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Melendez to please introduce himself. Dr. Melendez? Well, that might be a mistake. Uh, <laughs> my favorite subject is myself. <laughs> and uh, I never met a microphone I didn't worship. Uh, mm -hmm. But all kidding aside, this is a very serious topic. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. I am the health authority of Hidalgo County. That's the position that my responsibility is to serve as a liaison between what is math, what is science, and what is in the best interest of public health. Um, and so I take that with great responsibility. It has been the voyage of my life. Uh, I'm a very old man. Uh, I was uh, around when uh, HIV first came forth, where it was a pandemic. 35 million deaths later, where it's become uh, endemic, I'm still here. I've been in Afghanistan and Iraq. I ran the Green Zone Emergency Department. I flew Black Hawks Air. And uh, for the last 15 years, I've been serving as a public health person. Um, I'm a product of the people that are listening to us. I went to pre-K in McAllen. I went to public schools as uh, Wilson Elementary, Lamar Junior High. Um, I went to Pan American. I went to the University of Texas. I went to Baylor College of Medicine. So those of you all who are out there who are so integral in creating the future, and I said humbly, the future leaders or the future representatives to the leaders, I think several of us standing here is living proof that what you're doing is working. And so it's been the honor of my lifetime to serve you. And I welcome the opportunity to share the information that I have uh, when asked to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melendez. Uh, did I not tell you that it would be impossible for me to tell you what he has done? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm five foot five and a half. <laughs> Next, let me introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Vanessa Vale, uh, CNs. Vanessa and I work very closely together and have started to, uh, we will be putting together a, a series of mental health conference for our students, the parents, and also for the teachers and administrators in various schools starting in September of this year in partnership with Region 1. Vanessa actually serves as the Vice President for DHR Health Behavioral Sciences. The Behavioral Sciences uh, program at DHR Health is quite uh, large. That's all I can say, and I'll let Vanessa uh, talk about herself. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Rao, and thanks again for inviting me to be part of this. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, amongst my wonderful colleagues and to address a very important topic today. Um, I also am a native of the Rio Grande Valley, born in McAllen and raised in Edinburgh, Texas. I graduated from Edinburgh schools um, and attended the university here right in our backyard, uh, UTRGV. I graduated with a clinical uh, psychology degree and immediately started my career as a child therapist um, here at DHR Health. Um, I now serve as the Vice President for Behavioral Health Services, overseeing all of our inpatient and outpatient services. Um, I also have an appointed uh, position as a board member uh, with Tropical Texas Behavioral Health and the wonderful work that they're doing there. Very proud to be proud to be part of that organization. Um, and I also serve as a committee member with the Texas Department of Health and Human Services um, Advisory Council for Behavioral Health. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa and I will actually be in your face quite a lot uh, for the next uh, year or two because we'll be putting together this mental health conference, which uh, she's working extremely hard with us and with our colleagues uh, in uh, uh, Region 1, particularly in PATH program and the GERA program that we would be serving uh, going forward. Next, let me introduce Dr. Marissa Gomez Martinez, another um, person that I work very closely with. Marissa is actually a PI of a COVID studies, number of them have played an instrumental role in many of the uh, 
take-home test that you are actually doing right now. She was actually part with me as one of the co-investigators in um, the, the take-home test that you do for COVID uh, at the moment. She also participated in a number of studies related to monoclonal antibody infusions, uh, which were uh, before it was actually approved or by the uh, FDA. Uh, Marissa is actually the physician advisor at DHR Health, but more, uh, she's also medical director for the Edinburgh Consolidated Independent School District based health system. Uh, Marissa. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Sorry. Thank you for inviting me to be here today, um, and thank you for, for joining us today. Sorry. Um, so I am also a Valley native, born and raised in McAllen, and um, attended McAllen schools. I did attend UT, um, UTPA when it was UTPA, now UTRGB, and I did my medical school at Baylor College of Medicine in, in Houston. Um, I did my residency training in family medicine in San Antonio, Santa Rosa um, Hospital, and then worked in San Antonio for several years and made my way back to the valley, you know, back with family. So as Dr. Rao said, I am the medical director for the ECISD School-Based Health Center, and I also serve as physician advisor for DHR Health Urgent Care. Um, I'm on several committees in the hospital, but I am also a Girl Scout troop leader. <laughs> and I have helped form um, a new chapter of a mother-daughter organization, National Charity League. So I'm a founding board member, uh, VP of Philanthropy. So um, being part of the community is very important to me. So thank you for being here, for letting me be here today. Thank you very much, Marissa. And then we, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Castillo. J Dr. Castillo is actually works as a, um, he's also the health authority at Cameron County, but at the same time, he is also a physician at DHR Health. He is one of the few go-to person that I have when I need advice about uh, anything related to infectious disease, or for that matter, anything related to medicine. So Dr. Castillo. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rao. Uh, it's great to see a lot of Valley natives here. I, I uh, came through the Valley when I was a kid. My dad worked for the government, went to elementary school in Omito, uh, and then I was part of the first class of uh, UT San Antonio's Regional Academic Health Center. That's now UTRGV, uh, when they started the internal medicine residency in Harlingen. So when I saw Harlingen on the, the match, right, which is what doctors do to figure out after you graduate medical school, I said, wow, I'll check that out. I remember great things of the Valley. And when I came back here, uh, it was so great that uh, it's where I chose to relocate after medical school and have stayed ever since. Uh, I've been the health authority uh, for, for Cameron County for about 12 years. Um, been not, not through anything like this, obviously. This is a once in a, a generational type of scenario, but uh, other sort of public health emergencies. My main practice is um, internal medicine and uh, palliative medicine and hospice care. Uh, and some people wonder how on earth does that go together? And it turned out that the skills that you acquire in breaking bad news and talking to people about real serious things come in pretty handy during a crisis like this. Uh, and, it's, and it's been really um, uh, amazing to get to work with uh, the schools and everything involved uh, uh, with what it takes to, to and all the different uh, aspects of education and how it's impacted public health for sure. Uh, well, thank, thank you for having me on this panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Castillo. Now, so we have received a lot of questions uh, from parents, uh, also from teachers. We have put those questions together for you. Um, I have also taken the liberty, as I shared with my experts here, of actually putting uh, certain names to those questions so that we can actually not have a fight among themselves as to who's going to answer. <laughs> so the first question is both to Dr. Castillo and Dr. Menendez. Uh, Dr. Rao, yes. Okay. But they will. Yeah. How's this? Is this working well enough? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay. So this is a question both for the um, uh, Dr. Castillo and Dr. Menendez. 
statistics of COVID-19 in where we live. Um, I'll, I'll start with Cameron County. Uh, right now we're sitting at 106,000 uh, cases. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you believe the population statistics, that's uh, close to 20, 25% of the population with a confirmed infection. Uh, we know that it's gotta be multipliers higher than that in terms of the reality of it, uh, because we've been um, behind in testing compared to other parts of the country. Uh, right now, we're on a, we went through a nice lull and we're just starting to see the cases starting to climb up over the past week. Uh, at one point, the hospitals were down to almost zero cases uh, in the county, but lately that's gone up uh, to at least seven or eight cases over the past uh, past few days. Thank you. So, um, first of all, uh, Dr. Castillo is one of my heroes. Uh, I can't tell how proud I am to be sitting here next to him, I've, I've, even though he's old enough to be my, uh, my little brother. I've learned so much from him. He's, he's such an elegant person, as well as Dr. Garcia. I'm so proud to be here with him. Uh, there's a a real creep in history. Uh, his name is Stalin, and I hate quoting him, but he did have a quote that really caught my eye when we started looking at this, and he said, a million people is a statistic. One death is a calamity. So when it's that one person that's your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, when it's the 23 people who, who unfortunately were massacred uh, during this last shooting, those are tremendous, painful numbers. When we talk about statistics, we tend to lose the humanity and the pain that's associated to statistics. But it's math. And the three of us, the four of us, are mathematicians. Science doesn't mean, with all due respect, political science. It doesn't mean geographic science. For us, it means simple math. What is evidence-based, what works, and what doesn't? Not what, not what is on the internet. So the math in my county is as following. We have seen the same numbers today that we were seeing during the third week of the pandemic. That takes us all the way back to March, the latter part of March, the early part of April. We stopped paying attention so much as how many people have tested positive because as we all know, we have so many different ways of testing positive at home test, antibody test, antigen test, PCR test, those who travel, those that want to go back to school, those that want to go back to work. So we started paying more attention to something that's hard to not be objective about. And that's the number of people in the hospital and the number of people that died. And so those are the numbers. We look at everything, but those are the numbers that I've been most focused on because there's so much info. And we're in a good spot. We're in a good spot. We're down to 13 people in a uh, hospital system in our county that is supposed to be good for 2,000 people. Although actually it's about 1,200 because of our nursing staff. So we have less than 2% of the people in the hospital right now are COVID. Let's remind us that when we were back, what, in July of last two years ago, we were at 1,200. We're at over 100%. Well, how can you be over 100%, right? Uh, but we're over 100% of, of our beds of people that, in the house that had COVID. Remember that you had to die to get a bed. Someone had to die so you could get a bed. We were recording people in the ambulance space. We were having a you know, trailer 70 people, you know, waiting to be, you know, buried. And so our numbers today are dramatically improved where they were before. The numbers that worry us, so here, number one, our numbers are dramatically improved. We're almost at the level at the beginning. But number two, they're beginning to increase. Just like on the nation, we have a 60% increase in our nation in the last four weeks of numbers. Our numbers are beginning to slowly creep up, which makes a lot of sense, and we can discuss that later. So from Hidalgo County's perspective, numbers are very encouraging, light at the end of the tunnel, and how many times have we said it's over when Delta comes, when Omicron A becomes so too early to cry victory, but certainly there appears to be light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much, Dr. Menendez. Dr. Garcia, in your experience, since you are an in, uh, infectious disease expert, what are you witnessing in the hospital? Uh, basically, uh, uh, the same uh, perception as described by Dr. Melendez. Uh, we haven't seen a dramatic increase in cases uh, on hospital admissions in the last few weeks. Very few cases. 
And the cases that we have seen in the hospital are usually admitted for a different reason. And they are tested and they uh, turn to be positive without having really COVID symptoms. That's the majority of cases we're seeing right now, but very, very few cases. Yeah. Nothing compared to what was uh, a year ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gomez, uh, since you are a response physician executive for our uh, urgent care, what are you witnessing in urgent care? Uh, we are currently still seeing several cases of, of COVID-19. Um, thankfully, the, the patients are presenting with more mild symptoms, mild to moderate, and we, we're able to manage them through our urgent care at home and just watching them instead of having to hospitalize. Thank you. Uh, this question might be moot, but I'm still going to repeat it. Uh, this is for Dr. Gomez. When will there be a vaccine for younger children? And what are COVID-19 vaccine mandates for schools? Could you elaborate on that, please? Okay, yes, so starting with the vaccines for younger children, um, Pfizer has been working on a trial for the children aged six months to five years, and they currently have extended that to a three-dose series. Um, their data has just been submitted and they're waiting on the vaccine advisory committee to meet and the current date for them to meet will be June 15th. So once they meet, remember it's a process. This then has to go to the FDA, the FDA has to approve and then the CDC will approve. So we can potentially see these vaccines as early as the summer, um, but we, we, can't, we have to make sure that, that all of the processes are, are, um, are dealt with um, the way they should be. Um, so hopefully this summer. Um, as far as COVID-19 vaccine mandates for schools, there are currently no current uh, vaccine mandates. Um, the COVID-19 vaccine is not a, a, an obligatory vaccine the way other vaccines are. And, and we, we shall see how, how that pans out. Yes, Dr. Menendez. Thank you so much. That's an excellent answer. I would just like that just a little bit based on my experience. Um, I've been involved in the Moderna trials for the vaccination of children. We've had 135 people that were gracious enough to volunteer and their children to come get vaccinated, uh, ages between 5 and 11. Uh, excellent results. Uh, when you're dealing with the development of a vaccination, unfortunately, it's become so political. Uh, and in fact, the latest vaccines like meningitis, like rotavirus, have been the most difficult for people to accept, as opposed to the vaccines that were developed in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Uh, but point being is this, is that the vaccines for children, we've been told over and over, James, I don't know how many times you've heard, in a week, in a month, in three months, and they keep getting postponed. The two questions are safety and efficacy. It doesn't appear to be any question with efficacy with the children's vaccine. The question has been the appropriate dosage. Is it 50 micro? Is it 100 micrograms? Do we get half dose on the third? That's been the big question. And as the doctor quite perfectly explained, it's, it's a three-step process dealing with the bureaucracy of the government. Right now, all the literature that I'm seeing is would be 110% agreement, which is when it's 30 to 60 days, it should be something significantly more uh, concrete than one day. Um, secondly, with, in reference to the mandates, let's remember that there are 20 school, 22 municipalities, at least in Hidalgo County. Of those 22 municipalities, including the idea schools, are 17 school districts. These 17 school districts, five of them, had the courage to sue the governor. Uh, our, our governor, who is just as mo motivated as we are for our community, I'm sure we don't have monopoly on love for our community, but he decided that he was the emergency manager and he said, I'm going to do the mandates. It doesn't matter what local authorities do, what school districts do. So there was a lawsuit of which myself and other health authorities participated as expert witness uh, uh, in reference to mass mandates, et cetera, et cetera. What came across and what's important when we talk about mandates is that the uh, uh, Associate Supreme Court of Texas stated, quite frankly, that the argument of the school district, which is we are an elected body, we are a school board. We represent people in our community. We have the authority of those people that we represent. These are our buildings, these are our children, and we believe that we have the authority to mandate what happens in our schools, in our buildings, in our places. And the court decided that that was correct. 
So all mandates now, Dr. Castillo and I can make strong recommendations, the CDC can make strong recommendations, the federal government makes strong recommendations, we work intimately in conjunction with the school districts, but at the end of the day, mandates must come and can only come from those particular school districts. So Edinburgh can't tell Mission what to do, or Edinburgh, or El Meet, or what have you. So that's really the, 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 the legality of the mandates. Thank you, Dr. Mendelson. Dr. Castillo, would you like to add to this uh, from Cameron County? Uh, when it comes to the vaccine question, uh, it's, it's now into the, the boosters question. You know, efficacy is great. It does prevent uh, severe disease. Uh, the worst effects of COVID, the vaccine's working very well, uh, but the duration against uh, symptomatic infection or asymptomatic infection, it's not a very long-lasting vaccine. So it's protecting against the worst, but in the, in the midst of an upswing in cases, uh, if um, you're not boosted, you don't have a recent vaccine, you, you, you don't have that lasting protection against uh, infection, right? And we do care about infection. Um, so when it comes to infection right now, the, the opportunity for vaccines is in boosters. So if you're eligible for a booster, and, and that's 12 and over, and now uh, between 5 and 11 are now eligible for a booster, and it, that's with Pfizer, and those are the 10 microgram doses uh, between the, the 5 and 11-year-olds. It's just one-third of the adult dose. It's what's being used in that age group. Uh, so at the 12-year-old, uh, if you had a child who was 11 and then turned 12, and they got the vaccines and they're now due for their booster, they'll be getting the, the adult dose, the 30 microgram dose. Uh, but the newest, uh, the newest update was for the five to 11s uh, who are due for a booster, they can now get a third dose of the 10 micrograms. And it's probably a good time to do it right now, uh, looking into a, what we're looking at an upswing of cases leading into the summer. And if you look at our pattern, we seem to get this pattern in the summer and then again in the winter. Uh, so it's just following that same pattern uh, right now. So it's a good timing. So when it regards to vaccines, it's all about the boosters now at this point. And I concur with Dr. Castillo. Uh, back in um, June of last year, we actually went to the FDA ahead of uh, the uh, mandate for anyone to get a booster. We actually got a approval to give a third dose to anyone who is uh, six months out, not just immunocompromised, but anyone who is six months out. Then again, in uh, December, we went uh, back because our data was showing us that very quickly people were losing and the, uh, their uh, immunity. And the marker, whether good, bad, or ugly, was the level of antibodies against the virus. And we saw that the levels were actually dropping in people, particularly those who were uh, above the age of 50 years or had other comorbidities. And so we got another uh, approval from FDA to actually give a fourth dose to healthcare workers and anyone above the age of 65. And this was actually much before the fourth dose was actually approved for the rest of the population. I can tell you that last week on Friday, I actually got through an emergency IND the fifth dose. And I have just put in an application to actually give a fifth dose to anyone who is 90 days and above and whose um, uh, antibody levels are less than 100 uh, um, uh, arbitrary units per ml. And we are having on Thursday a discussion with the FDA to actually allow us to give the fifth dose again to healthcare workers who uh, fall in that category. So I think this is very important. Keep that in mind. Boosters are actually going to be uh, required on a regular basis. And I get, got myself a fifth booster uh, with an emergency IND. So, Dr. Garcia, would you like to add something, given your experience? Uh... Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, as you say, uh, the level of antibodies is not necessarily the only factor that will predict immunity. Correct. No, uh, so you might have a relatively low level of neutralizing antibodies, but there are other factors like cellular immunity that's not easy to quantify that may play an important role. Uh, so uh, uh, the fact that you have a relatively low level of antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that you are more susceptible to get a COVID infection compared to somebody who has a higher level. That's uh, something that's still under uh, investigation. 
Uh, and the second point, uh, the number of boosters that are going to be required and the interval between boosters, uh, I don't think we still know. Uh, uh, that's uh, been studied. Uh, there are factors that need to be considered. Uh, the patient's age, uh, the capacity of that patient to develop a good immune response to the vaccine, because uh, if we give a vaccine to a healthy 25-year-old, it's not going to be the same as if you give the vaccine to a 85-year-old uh, uh, patient who has uh, uh, immunosuppression because of cancer and chemotherapy. In this second case, uh, you will expect uh, that the capacity of that patient to respond to the vaccine will be much more limited. So uh, probably those patients who are at higher risk and have more comorbidities are the ones who are going to be uh, uh, having more benefit from the boosters. Absolutely. And it's not necessarily uh, going to be applied to everybody the same way. Yeah, I agree with that. Dr. Garcia and I keep on going back and forth about the level of antibodies and their as a marker for immunity, and I concur with him 100%, because your immune system is not frivolous. It does not keep on producing antibodies if there is no threat to it. Okay, so the level of antibodies really does not, is not a very good marker unless you actually have other markers such as cell immunity and also evaluated. Also keep in mind that antibodies are only going to um, neutralize circulating viruses. Once the virus enters a cell, it's actually the cellular immunity which is much more important than the antibody-mediated immunity. So I concur with him 100%. But unfortunately, that is the only marker that we have that we can readily use as a way of uh, signifying whether this particular person has developed immunity or not. And it's a bad one. I, I concur with uh, Dr. Garcia, it's a bad one. Since Dr. Garcia, you had the mic, could you take it back? Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make one comment yeah, on sure. that. I think we need to back up just one step because a lot of our audience are not doctors. And so when we talk about cellular mediated immunity and we talk about human immunity, it can lead to a little bit of misunderstanding. Up here, we're all nerds, so we're like frothing from the mouth, right? <laughs> but all of us have different levels of, of passion, right? We all have passion, different passion. I think what's good to say, and I, I don't know if y'all would agree, guys, is that we have to use something to measure to see how much our immunity potentially can be. We know that up to 10% of even world Olympian athletes cannot make antibodies. So, but there are alternatives. Dr. Rell's uh, head of a program that gives you preformed antibodies. So if you can't make antibodies because you have cancer or if you have lymphoma or you have something that suppresses your immune system. What is important to understand is the following. Number one, it's a battle between the virus, which is the antigen, right, producer, and us. Our soldiers are the antibodies. And so that's the battle that we nerds up here play. How can we increase our antibodies, right? And how can we attack the same enemy, like during the first Iraq war, that 10 years later, that enemy is completely different. So now they're not coming out and surrendering. Now they're doing white flags and shooting when you pick them up. And so the, the mutations and the variations are different than the ancestral strain. And so now we have to have different armaments, different antibodies, and that's where lies the problem. How long does this protection last? of the good guys, the antibodies, so we can kill the bad guys, which is the virus. And I think that's a simplistic way, maybe overly simplistic, but a way that I think most, most of our listeners can understand. Would you like to add something? Yeah. And the other way is to measure what are you trying to accomplish with the vaccine? Are, are you trying to prevent death and hospitalization and long COVID, or are you trying to prevent infection? And when it comes to preventing death, all the worst things that COVID seems to be able to do, the vaccines are, are holding up great uh, for long term. When it comes to protection against infection at all, that's where when your antibody levels come down, it lets the virus get a foothold, but then your immune system is ready. It's already trained and it rallies and it just crushes the infection before it can get out of control, before you get all those bad complications. And we see this all, we saw this phenomenon all the time with people saying, I don't want the flu vaccine because I got the flu. 
you know, or I got the flu from the vaccine, right? And, and actually, the flu vaccine was actually working. It's like you were alive to complain about that you got the flu. It worked. <laughs> this is great. So how we judge the success of the vaccine is also going to be important, especially because there's still a tremendous number of people who have opted not to get the vaccine for, for their own reasons. And then still even a bigger portion of people who have opted not to get the booster, the third dose. When I mean the booster, I'm talking about the third dose of the mRNA or somebody who got a Johnson & Johnson vaccine and has not gotten any other vaccines from there. I, I, heard you, I, I know you've heard a fourth dose and fifth dose. When, when I'm saying booster, what I mean is the third dose. And, and right now that's, that's pretty much showing that you need a third dose uh, to have that full level of protection. The fourth dose, fifth dose, that's where you see a lot of studies going on right now. But prevention against the worst this virus can do to you, the vaccines are great. Keeping up this protection against infection is, is where you, you're seeing this controversy about how many boosters do you need. Yep. Dr. Garcia, um, coming back to you, that one of the uh, uh, regularly we hear from patients who have been previously vaccinated and mm -hmm. got infected, they come back and said, hey, I got vaccinated, but I still got infected. This was something that Dr. Castillo just touched on. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on it? Uh, yes, uh, I agree 100% with what Dr. Castillo said. The, to me, the most important thing uh, in a COVID vaccine is to prevent hospitalizations and to prevent mortality. And uh, if you have a patient who has been fully vaccinated and uh, still got COVID, chances are uh, that he was in a much a better a shape to deal with infection as if he was not vaccinated. Uh, we have seen very uh, a little uh, cases that were uh, fatal uh, in this subgroup of, of uh, patients who, who were fully vaccinated. Sometimes they get sick, they, they are immunocompromised, they have other comorbidities. Uh, but uh, the, the mortality in that particular group has been extremely low. So I will say uh, in that sense, the, the, the vaccinations are, are holding, are holding, uh, are preventing hospitalizations, are lowering the, the mortality. They are not necessarily preventing the patient from getting infected. But at the end, uh, we, we, we are in a much better shape to deal with the infection. Just keep the mic up because I have another question for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> One of the questions that uh, was asked was, and in your experience as an infectious disease expert and among and the view of your colleagues who are in this field, will there be another surge? Uh -huh. uh, I better give the mic to Dr. Miller. <laughs> you don't. I'm going to say it for sure. <laughs> but, but why? Well, uh, says yes, but why? What? Uh, First, uh, what I have learned from uh, COVID is that COVID is not predictable. Uh, whoever is uh, trying to predict what's going to happen next is probably just guessing. Uh, now, based on what we know, I can try to guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we know uh, that uh, we are not dealing with exact same virus that we had at the beginning of the outbreak. There has been mutations, okay. uh, new variants have uh, developed, and every variant has been different as far as uh, uh, transmission. Some of them has been uh, more transmissible. Uh, as far as uh, uh, capacity to, to put patients in the hospital. Some of them uh, have had that, that capacity compared to, to others that has been relatively more benign. So even though it's the same virus, it's, it's, it doesn't behave uh, exactly the same. Uh, whatever it takes for the virus to develop mutations is replication. So as long as we have a group of uh, uh, patients or a group of people who does not have immunity against the virus. And when I say immunity, I mean immunity either uh, through vaccination or natural immunity. Uh, if we still have a significant proportion of the population that doesn't have this immunity, 
then uh, we are giving the virus to keep, we are giving the virus the opportunity to keep replicating. So new variants will uh, happen, and uh, we might have variants that will uh, be, uh, or that may have the capacity to evade, evade the immunity that we have right now by vaccination, for example. So my prediction is, yeah, they will have a, a surge a, of COVID, but at the same time, I don't think we'll have a, the same magnitude of the surge. I think there'll be a more control, a, a, a fewer number of a, hospitalizations, lower mortality. So Dr. Garcia has raised a very important issue, and I'd like to ask him this question. Dr. Garcia, keep the mic. <laughs> Um, Dr. Garcia has raised the issue that if you have acquired immunity from either natural infection or vaccination, that you will actually have less chances of actually creating mutants within you because you have immunity. There is a debate, hot debate out there that natural infection alone without vaccination may not be sufficient. Could you elaborate on that, uh, Dr. Mm, Garcia? Yes, I mean, uh, even though uh, uh, natural immunity definitely gives you some level of immunity. Uh, natural infection gives you some level of immunity. Uh, what these studies have shown is that the level, uh, and I will use the bad example that we used before, the level of neutralizing antibodies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, tends not to be as high as uh, uh, those that are uh, produced when, whenever you get the vaccine. Uh, uh, and is uh, more frequent to get reinfected when you just had the natural infection without having vaccination. You see more cases of reinfection in patients who, who have had COVID but who are not vaccinated. Uh, so uh, I, uh, based on that, I, I uh, believe that uh, the immunity uh, that you acquire through vaccine is uh, likely a stronger immunity than the immunity that you acquire through natural infection. But the best immunity will be probably be the combination of both. If you, if you have the uh, vaccine and you have uh, completed your, your uh, course uh, of vaccinations, uh, you're uh, fully immunized, and in addition, you get a COVID, that's probably uh, uh, the one that's going to uh, provide the, the highest, the highest level of immunity. I think Dr. Garcia is not suggesting that you go get yourself infected. No, 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 no. <laughs> That is not, not what he's suggesting. Not at all. If God forbid you get infected, that's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gomez, could you also comment on that about the natural infection and uh, vaccination? Um, in, in my patient experience, we've seen several patients who have been infected, not vaccinated, and then, you know, they get reinfected. But we also see those who've been vaccinated who get infected or reinfected. Um, but the, the course of their disease is pretty mild and something that I can easily take care of for them. So does vaccine, like we've all said, vaccinations are not 100% effective in preventing an infection, but what we're trying to accomplish is preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, death. And so, yes, very likely you will get infected if you've, whether you've been vaccinated or even if you've been infected before because of the new variants and new strains, um, it's likely going to happen. But the, the good thing is that those who have been vaccinated have done in my experience with my patients better and have recovered quicker and had mild disease um, if they get reinfected. I'm going to um, shift slightly our conversation towards mental health. A number of questions have been asked about the impact of COVID, the isolation that followed, the hybrid environment of uh, education that the children were exposed to during the COVID period and what impact that had had on not just the children, but also the parents and also the teachers who were under stress. Uh, so I'm going to ask Vanessa. Vanessa, the question that has come is, what is the psychosocial impact on children of isolation due to COVID-19? So that's a great question. Um, and of course, you know, being that it is a little broad, 
the psychosocial impact is going to be highly dependent on factors such as age, um, as well as you know other other factors. And so, we're social human beings. You know, it's part of what makes us human. And the human connection is something that's very important for healthy development amongst children, adults. You know, anyone of all ages. Um, and so, when the pandemic hit, you know, one of the most prominent things that we saw amongst individuals was really um, almost like a collective grief where everyone together was feeling you know so many social impacts of of having to one isolate because we know that isolation directly translates to loneliness right and so when you think of what it is and what it feels like to be lonely um, that that's something that everyone across many many different ages was experiencing. The effects of that, um, again, highly dependent on many external factors such as uh, family support, coping mechanisms, and, and other things that might either help or uh, hinder the way that you cope with psychosocial stressors. Um, you know that that those things are going to be dependent on on again how you internalize these things. So what I've seen in, in, in my um, experience with patients and especially at the, at the hospital and, and seeing the acute side of, of patient care um, is that a lot of children, you know, felt one, disconnected to their peers um, and that's school aged, right? Even all the way up to high school. Um, a lot of our adolescents would say, you know, you would think, and, and I was shocked when I learned that they were all wanted to go back to school, and I'm like, hold on, you know, pre-pandemic, all of you would say, I'm here because I don't want to be in school, and I have all of these stressors, and they say, no, well, I miss my friends, you know, we're, we're not even going to get to graduate, I'm not going to get to walk across the stage, I waited my whole life for this moment to have my parents and see my family in, the, in, in, in you know, the stands and, and cheer for me, and here I'm having to do a virtual graduation. I can't even say goodbye to my colleagues. So-and-so, you know, is going off to college, and who knows when I'll be able to connect with them again. So they lost, you know, a lot of very meaningful connections, and, and that, you know, in and of itself, you know, speaks volumes to what everyone collectively was experiencing. And so, you know, I could sit here for a very long time and talk about, you know, ongoing effects, but if you start to just, you know, take a step back and think of how that began to impact parents, you know, began to impact teachers in the schools who were having to make changes, you know, at the drop of a dime um, and accommodate. You know, I, I've heard stories where teachers have told me I would be interacting with, you know, first grade level children and they would have their baby brothers or sisters because, you know, maybe mom also was a teacher. And so she was in her room trying to teach her children and, you know, just a, a whole lot of, uh, you know, and all that, again, tied to the isolation, right? So um, a lot of effects that, that, you know, are going to continue to, um, you know, emerge as, as we begin to learn a little bit more about, you know, other effects. And we'll get into that, you know, long-term effects, but definitely, you know, just overall, you know, grief, a lot of, of, of increased risk for, you know, depression, anxiety, um, poor eating, sleeping patterns, all of that associated with social isolation. So one of the, thank you very much, Vanessa, and I'm going to come back to the two local health authorities here because they deal with many independent school districts in their counties. But one of the things that uh, have been, uh, we have noticed is the drop in the performance of these children. And for that, and, and that is reflected in the drop of performance of some of the schools and independent schools and the regions. Um, oh, can you give this to Dr. Melendez? Uh, I want him to talk about what his uh, observation is in the Hidalgo County. Um, yeah, just uh, 10 seconds to predate that. Um, Dr. Garcia, like Socrates said, the more we know, we know we know less and less. Yes. <laughs> And so predicting whether this will, the, the, the cases will increase, absolutely. Um, it's a great time later on to talk about what a pandemic versus endemic versus epidemic, which are the words that we use to describe the question that you asked. They're just the unit of, of weight is pound kilos, the unit of length is meters, feet, and the unit of 
the rapidity in which a disease process, that's, that's a pandemic, I mean, they're, they're units of rate. Uh, in reference to mental health, the first year, 2020, surprisingly and shockingly, we saw suicide rates go down. We saw depression go down. We saw anxiety go down. The theory that was because people were staying at home and forming family units, that there was more solidarity. It was us against the world. But by the time 2021 came, the statistics show that there was a significant increase in anxiety and depression. Performance at school goes without saying. And of course, everything you say not only is intuitive, it's true. And in regards to the immunity, there's no question that if you only measure antibodies, definitely acquired immunity through a vaccination is greater than natural immunity. But as Dr. Rao said previous to that, that's one of eight different things. So if you're looking for a football player, you might want to see how fast he runs, but you also want to see how much he, how much he can lift or how big is he or how well can he throw. But if you're just looking how fast he can run as the best athlete, maybe not. So, so there's no question about that. In reference to your specific question about what we're seeing in the performance of schools, what well, we're getting reported back to our interactions in Hidalgo County from the people that are listening to us, which by the way, 30 million kids in the United States at the age between five and 11, only 10 million have their vaccines. So when we talk about reservoirs for mutations and this to continue, one of the greatest reservoirs are the unvaccinated children that we all serve that are in our audience. Uh, with our uh, discussions with the school districts from Hidalgo County, it is painfully clear that there are two factors. One is, what is the performance that is measurable that we're help being held accountable to by the state government, by performance tests, by structural tests that say, what is their outcomes on these, on these exams that they're doing? And there's no question it's, it's gone down. The question is it because distance learning is not as effective as in-person learning? It, is it because of the social interaction? I don't think anyone has the answer to that. And then the second question that school districts have asking us, and, and like I see you can comment on that, and that is, we're just a lot more than just a place where kids go to learn. Correct. We're also like a secondary family. And so what are those psychosocial issues that we're seeing COVID that impacts us? Remember when we went to medical school, when we applied to medical school, I don't know about you, but a universal question was, why do you want to be a doctor? The second universal question is, who is the most important person in your community? And I think a lot of us say the school teachers, because the school teachers impact the entire family, not just the individual. So in Hidalgo County, there's been no question that the prolonged isolation from school has resulted not only in cognitive and structural measurable deficits in performance, but also in the well-being and the mental health, not only of the student, but their family, and guess what? of the family of the school teachers, of the children of the school teachers, of the husbands of the school teachers. So this has been a pretty intuitive and global phenomenon that we've seen. So the, let me just point out that the two of you are representing the entire Rio Grande Valley right now. Okay, not just Hidalgo and Cameron County. So anything that you know of the other two counties, just please comment on that. I think Hidalgo County is superior to Cameron <laughs> County. Other than that, I have no other comments. <laughs> Bigger, not necessarily better, but. <laughs> Yeah, it, we, we, don't, we don't know the fallout. I mean, uh, all I can say is uh, it's ongoing. Uh, a lot of the decline in depression anxiety was probably a decline in measurement, uh, a lack of interactions in school. You could say, well, child abuse went away because we weren't detecting it, and that's probably the opposite. And now you're gonna see all of the, the fallouts, which we were warned about, everybody warned about, and then the debate is, it, it, was it worth it? You know, now the debate is, it, was that worth the price we're, we're paying and we're gonna keep paying for a long time? Um, uh, the question is, what are you gonna do about it? And that's where I haven't seen the big innovation come through is like, well, how do we recover from this? Why do we keep doing the same thing, the same star test, the same this? Why do we have the same metrics? Why are we trying to hold everybody accountable as if nothing happened? It seems like, we, oh, schools reopened this year uh, and we're back to normal. All the same, that nothing changed, nothing innovated, and we know we're going to have to figure out how to help everybody who's been impacted by this. And now we're seeing the fallout, and I'm sure the teachers are seeing the issues with discipline and kids not, you know, everybody's always had discipline, but something's happened. Um, and I don't have the answer to that. I'm not. That's not my specialty. Um, on the public health side, uh, I think I was talking to one of the superintendents, and you know, the. Could we have done this differently? Obviously. But when you looked at what was happening in the hospitals, 
locally in our environment that they were going to collapse and and you know what would have been the impact of unmitigated spread if you didn't do anything that's where we're going to have to say was it worth it but uh, the price, the, the, the damage is done, but what are we doing to undo the damage? And that's where I'm not seeing the innovation. Uh, and I wish I had the answer to what to do about that, but I don't. Thank you very much. Many of you witnessed, and I'm going to be as apolitical as possible in my next question. Many of you have witnessed last month um, the difference in opinion between our judicial system and CDC as far as, as, far as face masks are concerned. Okay. In fact, today, if you actually wear a face mask and go into an airport or in a plane, people think you are infected. Last weekend, I actually traveled to Tampa, and uh, the person sitting next to me asked me if I actually sneezed and said, oh, you must be infected. That's the reason you're wearing a face mask. So this is where we have come to, and there is a question here. Uh, what is the risk of continuous use of face mask? And since uh, Dr. Castillo, you have the mic. You might as well start this and then give it to Dr. Gomez, if you don't mind. Did, did you say what is the risk of the risk? Of <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, the risk of the face mask is. Um, I think where we, I think where we were cutting off the age was probably a little bit extreme at the two years old and over. Uh, I think other countries may have had a, a different bend on this. I think the UK really handled this differently in their schools than we did, uh, where they were doing testing rather than masking. Uh, and at the younger ages, definitely nobody under five was wearing a mask in a lot of other countries. So I think it depends on the age. The dangers might be in the, in the younger ages, where that uh, ability to communicate, interact, or actually wear a mask effectively for it to mean something. And never mind that we were using what kind of masks, right? What kind of masks are we talking about here? So the dangers of a cloth face mask that nobody ever washes, that it's probably not effective, and it, if it, it can only, if it's not gonna help, it can only be hurting you. So in terms of, uh, of dangers, that's probably, uh, they're there, uh, but in effective face masks, how are we gonna use it going forward? Uh, I think if you look at the data out of the UK, 95% of secondary students in the UK are showing signs of either vaccine or infection because they did not use masks and they did not take much precautions. They kind of barreled through saying, you know, this age group is at very low risk of bad outcomes, uh, but obviously was a source of, of community spread. Was it worth the trade-off? They didn't have much disruption in their school life. Um, so the dangers of masks uh, going forward, I, I, I think we're gonna have to reevaluate the age appropriateness of the masks and maybe look at it as, uh, a, a seasonal uh, a seasonal thing or related to vaccine. Uh, but I, I think in Texas that might get decided for us yes. by our elected officials. <laughs> right, I, I agree with, with everything that Dr. Castillo just said. Um, the, it all depends on um, the type of mask and, and where you're using it as well, you know, but I do think that there is a time and place that, that especially children should be able to take their mask off and that goes back to tying into that psychosocial impact. I saw this with my own children. Um, one of my daughters just isolated, did not want to even go back to school, um, but now that she's back in school and has those few close friends that you know, she interacts with without the mask, it makes a big difference for, for those kids. So I think this also is going to tie into the psychosocial impact. Um, it's, you know, it's gonna be all dependent on, on what the level of virus is and all of the other factors that come into play in, in our community um, as far as needing to wear the mask. Um, but we, we just have to weigh all of, all of the factors. Dr. Wanna, Menendez? Yeah. I, I want to oh, add something ahead. real Vanessa? quick. Please do. Please um, do. Just because, you know, we, we all know how many times can you relate to going up to a baby and making these huge expressive, you know, facial expressions like, oh, you know, because children learn how to relate on an emotional level to adults, especially when they're nonverbal based off of, you know, facial expressions. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to comment on that. Um, 
it's very important that if you have little ones at, in the home to continue maybe even more so now uh, to use those facial expressions um, just so that it becomes a little redundant so that they can learn to communicate the same way because um, you know reading people's facial expressions is, is especially at a very young age extremely important to social development yeah I, thank you that's a very important i have a different take on this um, I have a different experience based on this. Uh, when I was preparing to testify for the court system, and I also did a little issue on CNN about why masks were important. So I want to start off by saying that I'm a number one believer in masks and strongly endorse them, uh, much so that we did a mask mandate, uh, which, by the way, we learned that those schools that did not, that did not have mask mandates were actually more compliant than those that did. So uh, we have two school districts whose name I don't want to say uh, because they're probably listening to us. But one of them was a non-mandate school, and they had a 95% compliance rate. And the other was a mandate school, and they only had a 92%. So I think when, what I've learned, one of the many things that I've learned, is that if you force someone to do something, they're just going to be oppositional, you know, you know, opposite day. But if you convince people and you continue to convince people, because our job is very frustrating because people listen to social media. So we have to continue, 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 and not give up on the message, right? Uh, so I think for us, the mandates were a little counterproductive from that perspective. But we, you know, as we go, we learn. But in reference to, and I know you smile when the question was asked, like, what could there possibly be against masks, right? Like, that's what kind of question is that? Well, to the person who asked the question, which is, what negative impact could, not, could wearing a mask lead to? Okay, so really good question, because when you're going to argue one case, you have to understand the other case. We know the benefits because we can actually measure the amount of whatever you're testing, whether it's asbestos or a virus. We can measure how much of that safety that you're looking for is in front of the mask and behind it. You do diffuse techniques, and that's how these masks are rated as N95 or N93. You actually measure the amount. And we all know, especially like Garcia knows, about viral loads. So the idea is that the less virus that you had, the lower viral load, and probably, who knows, it's all theoretical, probably it wasn't as bad as if you had a higher viral load. So, well, the, the virus is a lot, lot, lot uh, smaller than the hole in the mask. How can it possibly work? It's like having someone, you know, uh, not leave jail with the door open, right? Well, people don't understand Bernoulli. People don't understand flow mechanisms. People don't understand those uh, thermodynamic laws of physics, which say that as that small little tiny particle goes through that big window, it gets pushed against the wall. So even though it may be smaller than the wall, there's some mechanisms at a flow mechanism that holds them to the wall. So they work. N95 or a ski mask. Obviously, that's myself or Canelo Alvarez. Who do you want to fight, right? You want the N95, right? And so, but in reference to what is bad, okay, what is bad? You can't breathe. A lot of people just couldn't breathe. People with asthma, people with COPD, Okay, what about people who had congenital defects of their, of their very low, but there were some people that masks probably, probably not the best thing for them, okay? So the emotional aspect of it. Those that argued against us, us mask defenders would say, you have to learn how to socialize. You have to be able to see people's expressions. We're missing out so much. The real question that should have been asked by this person, in my opinion, is what is more deleterious? the bad stuff for wearing a mask, or the good stuff for wearing the mask. And it's a no contest. So whatever you can come up with that is a detractor from mask use, minuscule compared to the benefits of using a mask. Correct. And, and let me just elaborate on what Dr. But this is very important, what Dr. Melendez said, that the multiple layers of your mask are the ones that is preventing the virus from actually entering into you. It's not the single layer. So when they... Go, pass through the first layer, they get pushed against the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, they probably never have even enter past the fifth layer because they are actually getting pushed around on the side or uh, unable to penetrate the, uh, the various layers. Uh, Dr. Garcia, what is your take on that? The, whether uh, we should use mask or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't see you wearing one. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing one before coming to you. <laughs> You're so tall, nobody. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think uh, you have to assess your personal risk and uh, respect the decision of uh, the people who is around you. Uh, right now, uh, uh, we are uh, at a, a better position. And, uh, as we previously discussed, we have lower uh, number of cases in the community. There is a very nice tool from the CDC that allows you to, to see the community uh, risk level by counties, and that's updated on, on a weekly basis. And um, we see that both Hidalgo and Cameron County right now, we are in, in the green. Uh, and the green means that the uh, use of, of mass is optional, uh, but it's still recommended uh, for uh, patients who are not vaccinated or uh, those who have uh, chronic medical illnesses, some degree of immunosuppression. In those cases, it's still recommended if they are going to go to an indoor uh, space with no very good circulation that may be a little bit crowded. Uh, then you have the yellow uh, when the risk is intermediate and the orange color when there is a, a, a stronger recommendation for the use of masks. No? So I think that's an important tool and it's uh, very easily accessible. So, Dr. Garcia, hold on to the mic because uh, you must have heard from your patients, and I've heard this numerous times when people come for treatment, that uh, I ask them, so you are wearing masks, and the response is, do you go to restaurants? Yes, I do. Are you wearing masks? Yes, I do. I only wear masks, and here is the statement they make. When I am walking into a restaurant, because I think most of the viruses are actually in that particular environment, but when I sit down, I take off my mask. Okay, not that when I eat, but when I, when I get up, I wear mask again because again I'm walking and that's where people are coming. What is your view of that? Uh -huh. uh, if you, there, there are different factors to consider. Uh, if you go to a restaurant, uh, a small space, uh, not a high ceiling, no, no good ventilation, lots of people in a small space, obviously the risk is going to be higher. If you go to, to a restaurant that has better circulation, that have a outdoor space, I mean, uh, the risk uh, will be lower. I mean, the, the depends on the setting of, of the restaurant, but the point to me is if you decide to go to the restaurant, you are running a risk. Uh, a small, medium, or high depends on the level of transmission in the community at that particular time. But you are running a risk, and if, if you want to go to the restaurant, uh, you have to consider that there is a chance uh, that you might get infected uh, during that time. Uh, at, at the end, uh, you have to calculate your own risk and make your own decision. But the fact that uh, you go with a mask and then remove it at the time you are sitting and then put it back whenever you exit the, the, the restaurant, I don't think will provide any additional benefit. Thank you. Uh, since uh, the mic is with you, let me ask you another question. Uh, the question is, what is long COVID and how do we treat it? Now, if you had an answer for that, you have a Nobel <laughs> Prize. Uh, I, I wish I have a, a good answer. That you, you are giving me all the more difficult, the most difficult questions. <laughs> uh, long COVID, uh, well, it has different names. It's also known as post-COVID and has other names. Uh, and we're still learning about it. What we know is that uh, patients who are infected with COVID, the great majority of patients will recover within a few days and sometimes within a few weeks. But when you have uh, symptoms that extend beyond four weeks, that's uh, when you start talking about a, a long COVID or post COVID. And it's not just one, two, three symptoms. There is a variety of symptoms that have been described. Uh, some, uh, the most common ones probably are like fatigue. You feel tired all the time. You have some shortness of breath, mostly with exercise. That's another one. You have headaches. 
Uh, sometimes uh, symptoms may be kind of similar to those symptoms described by chronic fatigue uh, patients. Uh, there are uh, some other symptoms that in, include like, or, or signs like include skin rashes, uh, uh, fevers, uh, probably more rare, but uh, possible too. So uh, basically when, when you are symptomatic after four weeks uh, of having the uh, infection, that's when you start talking about long COVID. Now, uh, what we know, and what we know is very little, is uh, that those patients who get sicker on the initial infection are those who are at higher risk to develop long COVID. Uh, that doesn't mean that if you have a mild illness, you, you cannot develop long COVID. You, with mild illness, you can still develop it, but it's less likely. So the sicker the patient, the higher the risk to develop long COVID. And uh, what to do about it, uh, depends on what's your major symptom. Uh, the therapies are more uh, directly at the, at the uh, symptom that is making the patient uncomfortable. Sometimes uh, physical therapies, uh, rehab, uh, psychological uh, therapies may, may, may be uh, important in those uh, uh, cases. Group therapies have been uh, tried as well. But uh, this is a field that is uh, evolving. We are still learning from it. And I'm sure that we'll, we'll have uh, more information in the next uh, few months uh, regarding these post-COVID uh, syndromes. Thank you. Dr. Gomez, uh, in your outpatient setting, what is your experience with long COVID? We've had a lot of patients with long COVID. Um, and, and again, like... Dr. Garcia stated, it's an individualized approach because each patient is going to have a different symptom, you know, from brain fog to trouble breathing when they exercise when they used to be marathon runners. So it's about tailoring the treatment to each patient, you know, what their baseline was, where they are now, and then trying different treatments to get them back to their baseline and letting them know that they may not ever be back to where they were before. And that's, you know, some reality for some patients. But just continuing to, to help patients, you know, through it individually. Um, Dr. Menendez, um, a question is, can a district legally quarantine a student that was exposed? One comment, long COVID, the, for lay people, for people who are listening to us, the theory is this. When you are infected by virus or anything else, there's an inflammatory response systemically. And so you're inflamed in your heart and your gut and your, and, your, and your muscles. In fact, autopsies of people who have died from automobile accidents six months after COVID, nothing to do with COVID, when they do biopsies, it shows inflammatory responses still in some of their organs. So we know that there is a long-term inflammatory response from people with COVID. The thought process is that whether it's slow reactive substance of anaphylaxis for the nerds, or it's a histamines, or it's Ig mediated, there is a process of an inflammatory response that affects different parts of your systems. And guess what that is? That includes your emotional system, your synapse, your emotional stuff. So there's no question that there is a long-term effect secondary to an inflammatory mechanism. How long? We don't know. We've only had it for two and a half years. But is it real? Absolutely. In children, it's actually very measurable because they're still very young. So you can exclude a lot of different things. You can actually see an event. Perfect COVID, sub-COVID inflammatory issues. So treatment, as the good doctor said, is supportive until we have more information. In well, reference pause to- for the, Pause for the book, answering the question. I have another question for you, oh. which is related to that, and then also with Dr. Castillo. Sure. So let me put both of you health authority experts on, on a spot here. Do we have a, when are we going to have a long COVID clinic in Rio Grande Valley? So my, uh, my initial response is, it will have to depend on people like yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it takes a system. Let me tell you, um, do I look like a person that, no, I don't, right? No, man. What you see is what you get. I cannot tell you how, I guess the word is, how grateful that, that we are. I know I speak for Dr. Castillo because our success that we had, and we've been called from people all over the world to measure the success with COVID, depended on collaboration. 
collaboration between school systems, collaboration between governmental agencies, governmental with health departments, governmental with public institutions like universities, cooperation from Republicans and Democrats, from politicians, for once came together and said, this is how we need to collaborate to make this happen. In fact, the number one lesson that I learned was we're putting our priorities in healthcare and silly stuff. We need to be putting in diabetes, hypertension, obesity. But those of us who are family doctors have understood that for years. Because when I go to a party, my mom says, my son's a family doctor. Okay? His mom says, my, my son leads a research institute. Her mom says, oh, he's an infectious disease. So even socially, diabetes, hypertension, obesity has taken a low step. And that we know is the underlying how healthy is your community is what's going to happen. But is taking care of diabetes and hypertension and obesity, is it sexy? No. Do you get paid $72? No. You get $23,000 for a knee replacement. That's right. So the reason that I am pre-stating this question is, when are we going to have a clinic? One, I like to talk a lot. And two, <laughs> unless someone does it for free, because there is no motivation in anyone seeing people for 55 mugroso dollars. And so we need people like him who are dedicated to right, that are subsidized by another agency, but guys like him and I, who get paid per patient, we can't do it. We can't do an hour of, of an assessment for $52. And so I think that the day will come, because I think it's a real disease. I don't think it's a psychosomatic disease. It's a real disease. And I think it's going to come. But I think it's going to depend from people who are a lot more altruistic. Can you give... Uh I was going to say, it better be after we see universal primary care access. Because yeah. <laughs> if we're focusing on bringing dollars down for long COVID, which is no doubt impacting lots of people, before we focus on basic access to primary care, we've, we've, you know, we've really messed up there. Uh, it, we're, we're working about long COVID, but we're not treating diabetes. You know, insulin prices are insane. We're not doing the basics. You know, uh, uh, you're hearing the news about monkeypox, right? But nobody's talking about how Texas is leading the nation in congenital syphilis. That's right. Right? And to break, the, the classic run-of-the-mill old stuff is not sexy. Um, uh, but the new stuff is, is getting the attention and it's grabbing the headlines. Uh, I, I think you'd have to go back to say, we got bigger issues, uh, and from the county health authorities, both Hidalgo and Cameron, all counties have uh, an indigent health care program, uh, and that is um, the, the most basic, basic access to care, and still we don't, it's not enough uh, by, by, by and far. So I wouldn't see that coming from public health, but you might see innovative institutions uh, like yours uh, lead the way in those kinds of fields. Thank you. Can you go back to the question? You say so more, <laughs> so less bar than me. Um, the, let me repeat the question because it's an interesting question. Um, I'd like to really know who made this question. It's a super interesting question. That is isolation rooms, quarantine, and isolation guidelines. Can a district legally quarantine a student that was exposed, right? So the theory is who has the authority to tell the student you can't come, and if you do come, you have to stay in that room with all the other people with brown eyes or that are coughing or that tested positive or whatever it may be. So you're looking at a, um, a uh, personal freedom question, uh, and then you're looking at well-being of your community of students and teachers, right? So because I don't know, but someone sneaked the question to me two days ago, I went to our attorney, the attorney that works for the county, and I asked him the same question, and I said, what are your thoughts? And he says, from a pure legal perspective, the schools have the authority to implement whatever measures that they think are appropriate for their particular school district. So if you believe that you're at risk children, autism, developmental delays, chronic respiratory problems, if you believe that this particular subpopulation in your school, which is already isolated, they're not in the general population of students. If you believe that you need to place this type of program, you can have a strong argument. If the school chooses to do that, remember, health authorities can make recommendations, but they can't force the school based on you know, what we talked about earlier. Sure. So if the school, those who are listening, want to implement that, you're on good legal ground. But at the same time, I can assure you 100% that someone's going to challenge it for you. 
I don't know if I answered the question. Dr. Castillo, yes, you did. Dr. Castillo? Yeah, this, this goes back to the beginning of what's the bar that it takes for the health authority to legally quarantine somebody under criminal penalty. And it's not just a simple notification or routine thing. It, it, it's a real individualized. The best analogy is to active tuberculosis, you know, where we have a a lot of our laws are really written around TB when it comes to quarantine, if you think about it like that. So, um, you know, quarantine would mean if a person's been exposed, I think that's a tough one. If a person is actively infectious, um, I think there's more teeth to that. Uh, but even with COVID, it, goes, it comes and goes so quickly that by the time you go through the whole process, it's already, it's already passed. So I think it's really hard to use our current laws to implement any sort of anything that would stick in terms of quarantine and isolation. You know, I mean, we had a, we had a super spreader at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, this is Could you take the mic, please, Dr. Yeah. Manu? I just illustrate this point beautifully. Yeah. Um, we had a super spreader at the beginning of the pandemic. We're talking about May of uh, 2020. And we felt that this person was directly responsible for infecting over 17 people. And he kept getting told, remember at the time, we were still issuing written, people would knock on your door, you know, dress with the uniform and say, you can't leave your house. Of course, when you get thousands of people, you can't do anything. But at the time, we were still doing that. And guess what the scoundrel would do? He didn't care. So a couple of family members later who died that he infected, and a couple of times that uh, he would get caught by the epidemiology crew at pachangas and at barbecues, because people still weren't listening, they finally were able to get a court, order, a court order from one of our judges to have him apprehended. Unfortunately for him and fortunately for humankind, uh, he became so sick that he had to be hospitalized himself. So I think that illustrates a point of to what extent the irresponsibility of this person um, got to before we were able to do anything about it. So it may, legally in the United States, that it's my right to do this and that. It's, it's highly respected and sometimes gets us in trouble, I believe. Dr. Garcia, there is a lot of uh, questions in people's mind about which particular test is more accurate versus the other, the timing of when the test should be done, uh, whether the home test should be done immediately when you have the first cough, or how long they should wait to, to actually determine if they are COVID positive. Could you, uh, in your experience, could you just share with us what you would recommend? Sure. Uh uh, we basically have uh, three different types of testing. Uh, one is uh, the molecular testing or PCR. Uh, that's uh, probably the gold standard. Uh, uh, it's the most sensitive test, usually done through a nasopharyngeal swab, a deep swab. And uh, the the problems with the test is that it takes more time. Uh, you get the results not necessarily the same day. Sometimes it may take one or two days, depending where you do it. And uh, it's uh, more costly. That's the PCR, or molecular testing. Then we have a cheaper test that's the uh, antigen, and that's the one uh, we do at home. That's uh, the home kit. Uh, that's a antigen or rapid antigen test against COVID. The sensitivity is not as high as uh, the PCR test, but still have an acceptable sensitivity, uh, especially if you are symptomatic, especially if you are symptomatic. And it's definitely uh, much, much cheaper compared to the uh, PCR. And the third way of uh, testing uh, will be more for epidemiological purposes, which is the blood test or serologies where you quantify antibodies. Uh, that usually doesn't help for the diagnosis in, in clinical grounds because it takes some, a number of days for, for the patient to develop antibodies. And most of the serology tests do not discriminate between antibodies that you form because of previous vaccine versus antibodies that you form because of natural infection. Some of them do, but many of them don't. So uh, at the end, uh, for a clinical purposes, we are uh, left with either uh, the PCR or the rapid antigen. 
And uh, either one is, is uh, acceptable uh, way to, to do the testing. What I will recommend is uh, if you are symptomatic, you have symptoms uh, related to COVID, uh, and you have the antigen available, do it, do it. And if it's positive, that's all you need. You already have enough evidence, you have symptoms and you have a positive antigen test, uh, you have enough evidence to, to say, okay, this is COVID, period. If you have symptoms and the antigen test comes negative, then uh, in that uh, case, you might consider doing a PCR uh, to verify that the uh, antigen test was not a, a false negative uh, result. Uh, but that's for the patient who has symptoms. Uh, many times, uh, testing is done also for the exposed patients uh, or uh, exposed uh, people. I mean, you don't have symptoms, you're completely fine, but your uh, father, mother, wife, husband just tests the positive. In those cases, uh, the recommendation is if you don't have symptoms, wait uh, for a period of about five days. Yep. Yeah, and, and then do the testing. So uh, you will have uh, a better uh, 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 accuracy in the results. Uh, if uh, before the five days you start having symptoms, then you do it earlier. If you become symptomatic on day three or day four, then you, you do it when you, whenever you become symptomatic. But if you remain asymptomatic, wait at least five days before doing the, the testing. In your experience, Dr. Garcia, would you recommend people actually doing tests when they complete their isolation or quarantine period and they're integrating back into the workforce? For the majority of cases, no. Uh, for the great majority of cases, I will uh, uh, consider a duration of illness and clinical improvement. Okay, uh, according to CDC, uh, and, and this will apply for, for most of the occupations. Healthcare workers may be a, a little bit different because we deal with immunocompromised patients. So you want to, to, to be completely sure you're not going to contaminate anybody else. So for healthcare workers, you might consider using the test-based uh, clearance. But for, for the rest, uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll go by symptoms and duration of illness. Uh, if uh, it's been over five days since the onset of symptoms, you haven't had fevers for the last 24 hours, and your respiratory symptoms have improved, then uh, you might leave isolation. And if you are going to uh, be in a public place, indoor place, then uh, wear an N95 mask for the following uh, five days to complete the total of 10 days. Okay, thank you very much. It's gonna be very rare to actually have these five people of this expertise sit together and talk to you about what their view and their experience has been with COVID. So they, we are very lucky to have these individuals spare two hours, three hours of their time uh, to educate us, particularly myself. I'm really getting educated by them as we go along. Vanessa? Dr. Rao, one thing I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I have to say because of the audience that we have sure. now, and I, I don't know how you feel about this, but one of the concerns, by the way, very eloquently stated, PCR the best, $600,000 machine, antigen second best, $11, antibody monitor. Um, be aware of what variant we're in, ancestral strain, wait five days, Omicron, BA2, wait two days, um, used to be 10 days, 14 days. So just keep paying attention to the health department or the CDC because it will change. Uh, what Dr. Garcia says is 100% correct, but because we've seen so many different changes every two months of recommendations, pay attention. Specific, what I must say is to the, our audience, please do not assume that like last year that you will get funding to have these tests available at, at the school. It was a slam dunk all last year. And intuitively, I believe that it's pretty likely that you'll get funding for it. But, and I know that this is a sophisticated audience that I'm addressing this issue, but it would be irresponsible of myself to not remind you, now that we're on testing, that you must still continue to fight to get the funding so you can have enough tests so that you can use testing for what? For epidemiology, right? To make sure people stay at home when they're supposed to stay home. 
I mean, you're not in the business to diagnose people. Sure. You're in the business to help protect your environment. And so I just a reminder, and that is uh, do not assume that the money's going to be there for testing at school the way it was last year. Uh, keep fighting for it. Vanessa, I have a question for you. This is actually a, a mother who has sent this particular scenario, which is she is experiencing in her home, and I'm going to read it for the audience. My child was an outgoing kid before COVID-19 and has now become quiet and does not like to socialize with friends or family members. Will going back to school help her become a child that she once was? So that's a great question. And you know, it's important to understand that every child is going to adapt differently. Um, I think it's also important not to compare one child to another um, in terms of how they're going to improve or not improve um, in any symptoms or psychosocial hindrance that they may have experienced as a result of, for example, isolation. Um, going back to school, um, I, I think that there's, you know, compelling evidence that shows that socialization, especially in an academic setting and a school setting, is very positive for children. So from a, you know, psychosocial or emotional development standpoint, um, children should, and, and I say should, you know, improve in, in the way that they interact with one another as they continue to be continuously exposed in an academic setting. But that's not going to be the case for all children, and it's going to be highly dependent on how we as a community um, really fight for and, and emphasize the importance of allocating appropriate and abundant resources for children, understanding that not all children are going to display symptoms where you can say, okay, this child needs help or this child is, is not adjusting well. Um, many children on all different levels are going to be experiencing um, some sort of, of psychosocial or emotional distress as they, you know, adjust back to life as some of them knew it and some of them were too little that they didn't, they weren't even in school. Um, and so it's going to be important, you know, that we emphasize, you know, aside from just, you know, going back to school alone, I don't think is going to fix anyone. Um, surely the support systems that are built into the schools, the counselors, the teachers, the peer support, all of that um, should help children in general, but we need a whole lot more than that. You know, we need collective support and mental health resources for our kids. So I, uh, let me just elaborate on this and how I came across this particular question, and that would be, that would lead us to the next question. This was a question that was asked by one of our neighbor, okay, and uh, the question that she asked, and probably you have already responded to that is, should I get some professional help for her? Yes, absolutely. Um, anytime you notice a change in, in your child, and really you should ask yourself, what makes my child my child, right? So what, what makes Vanessa Vanessa? Um, you, you want to ask that question, and, and that also goes for if you're a teacher, if you're a counselor, and you have close relationships with, with anyone. And this doesn't only apply to children. This applies to anyone. What makes someone who they are? And when you start to see changes to what made that person who they were, and in this case, you know, specifically not socializing with friends or family members, um, it's, it's always important to seek professional help. You know, the same way that you would if, if you noticed that your child, you know, got a runny nose or started coughing a little more, you know, right away, if you can't put your finger on what's going on, you seek professional help from your primary care physician. Do you want to do the same thing for mental health and for any, you know, social development that you see that, that may be hindered um, in your child? So absolutely, the answer would be yes, I, I would seek professional help. Well, I'll have one more question, which is actually on the minds of many people, and then we will go on to some of the questions that we have just received. Um, unfortunately, I haven't even finished half of the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> and this would probably require an entire day with these uh, experts here. Uh, Dr. Garcia, the question is for you. I'm, and I'm not giving you all the hard questions, by the way. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so there is a lot of uh, uh, concern when the infusion center was shut, uh, closed because we had a drop in the number of cases in our community. And when the numbers are rising now, uh, and we know that there are no monoclonal anti not much is available, mm -hmm. uh, people are asking what uh, treatment options are available in a, uh, a, a, a non-hospital setting for patients who are COVID positive. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some outpatient therapies that we didn't have a, a few months ago. Uh, our options were uh, definitely more limited uh, uh, last year. Now uh, we have a, a few antivirals uh, that have uh, proven effective in preventing hospitalization. Uh, the one that uh, looks better as far as uh, hospitalization prevention, uh, that has uh, better numbers, is uh, called Patslovit. It's a five-day course. It's a combination of two antivirals in, in one packet, uh, and they, they work synergistically. Uh, the issue with that is that may have interruptions uh, with some other medications, so uh, the prescribing physician uh, should check uh, if uh, the patient will be a good candidate uh, for that particular medication, the Patslovit. Uh, the other thing to consider is that not everybody with COVID uh, will really require uh, antiviral treatment. Uh, these, these antivirals are usually reserved for the unvaccinated or for those who are vaccinated but who has risk factors to uh, develop complications. Mm -hmm. If you have cancer, if you have immunosuppression, if you are morbidly obese, is chronic lung disease, chronic uh, uh, heart disease, all those are risk factors. So uh, in those particular situations is where, when, when, wherever you are gonna recommend these antivirals, but it's not for everybody. So that's a point I wanted to clarify. So Patslovit will be one option. The other option, uh, it's a little bit more difficult, but still quite effective, is Rendesivir, which is the antiviral we use in hospitalized patients. Uh, also, uh, good results when used uh, early in the disease, uh, good results as far as preventing uh, 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 complications uh, um, and also preventing hospitalizations in we, if we give it to the, in the, in the outpatient setting. But the problem with that antiviral is that it doesn't come as a pill. It uh, comes intravenously only and it's given uh, once a day for three days. So we have to set up uh, three days of uh, intravenous infusion. Uh, the third option uh, we had is uh, what you just mentioned, monoclonal antibodies. The, the issue with the monoclonal antibody has been that uh, since we have developed new variants, the initial monoclonal antibodies that were effective at blocking the original uh, variants uh, do not longer uh, work well for the new variants. Uh, so uh, the, the ones we use at the beginning are not longer recommended. We have uh, some new ones, as you know, uh, but still with very limited data, like to make a strong, a strong recommendation. Uh, there is a third antiviral, uh, monulpiravir, uh, it's from Abbott, and it uh, can be used, it's also a five-day course, has less interruptions, and I will reserve it uh, if we do not have access to any of the other therapies that we have mentioned because the, the numbers, the, the benefit that it provides are more uh, limited. Uh, so. That will be probably my, my last resource. Thank you very much. Dr. Gomez, um, the urgent care is currently offering monoclonal antibody treatment. Could you elaborate on that? A lot of people have asked. Yes, of course. So we, we are offering one of the monoclonal antibody treatments, and it is by appointment. So at, this would be at DHR Health Urgent Care, Monday through Friday, 10 to 3. We are offering appointments for patients with confirmed COVID-19. You have to have a verified test, not just an at-home test. Um, we would be happy to test you in the clinic, and that would help 
qualify you, provided you meet criteria otherwise with a high-risk condition that could lead to severe disease. Um, and that clinic is located on 1421 North Colonel Row in McAllen. Um, the phone number is 362-5030, and your physician or healthcare provider can, can help um, secure an appointment for you or your loved one who, who is infected and high risk. So, yes. And then I just wanted to comment back on, on the question that, um, that Vanessa was answering. Um, we just have to also remember that our kids, everybody is changed right now with COVID. So I don't think any of us are really ever going to be the same. And to, to think that your child is going to be back to where they were before, we have to remember um, to celebrate every success and know, nurture them through the changes and, and just know that the things are going to get better, but we just can't have those. We have to have realistic expectations. That's right on point. Now. Jacqueline, you have some questions that have been... So we have two questions, well, two submissions online from our participants. And the, this one is a three-part question. It's from Melissa Galvan. And I believe this is for uh, Dr. Ricardo Garcia. And it says, <laughs> <laughs> all People love him. It's a three-part question. Yeah, he gets a three-part. Yeah. Um, and if, if we can um, just repeat the question so that the people on Facebook can hear us. Um, the question is, as COVID-19 virus mutates, does it generally mutate weaker or stronger? Does immunity become stronger? Or will we continue to need continuous inoculations? Could you repeat the question? Uh, uh, you're better at <laughs> So the question is a three-part question. Uh, the first is that uh, when the virus mutate, does it become stronger or weaker? Uh, the immune, immune reaction that it actually uh, elicits, is that uh, strong or weak? And what was the third one? Will we need Free continuous inoculation? Oh, and would we need uh, a co not continuous inoculation? Of, I'm probably uh, multiple vaccinations mm. is what they're asking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have to admit that whatever I say right now may change in the near future. Uh, what we know, uh, Delta, uh, uh, the Delta virus uh, carry a, a higher hospitalization rate and uh, uh, by numbers apparently a higher mortality compared to Omicron. And so the virus mutates and uh, based on that, you might get to the conclusion, okay, it's mutating, it's losing its capacity to uh, be lethal. Uh, it's more contagious, but it's less lethal. And uh, I will say, uh, not so fast. <laughs> uh, don't forget that now more people in the community have some level of immunity, as we discussed, no? uh, either by vaccine or by natural uh, immune, uh, immunity. Uh, so uh, we might have a better capacity to fight the virus. It's not necessarily that the virus is losing its uh, lethality. So yeah, mutations are happening and it's making the virus more transmissible. That's clear and there is no doubt about it. But uh, as far as the virus is losing its lethality, uh, I have some reservations. We, we are in better shape, we're dealing better with the virus. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's it. That's the only conclusion I can make from that. Uh, as far as the... Ricardo, before you go yep. that, the other school of thought is the purpose of mutations is what? Survival. Survivability, right? right? Survivability. It's not lethality. So Ebola kills everybody. They're bleeding from two blocks away. Big problem, but it's not pandemic. SARS, the original SARS, same scenario. So we've seen an evolution with human beings, Homo neanderthal, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, is that mutation doesn't necessarily make you a bigger brute, a stronger person, a taller person. 
what it does is it makes you the ability to survive. And so I think that he's 110% correct in saying that it's too early to say that just because BA1 is not as bad as Delta and lethality is not as bad as ancestral, BA2 is not as BA1. And as we go down the road, the misconception is it's automatic. Mutations equal survivability but not lethality. Not necessarily so. So I, I think that's the yeah. best point. Okay. The second question was? <laughs> <laughs> the the second question was, um, does immunity become stronger or will we continue to need, and again, it says continuous inoculations, but I believe it will Continuous vaccine. Depends on the mutation. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, I think the more exposure you have, the stronger your immunity will become. And whenever I mean exposure is probably uh, the more exposure to vaccines, or the more exposure to the natural virus, no? Uh, and once more, if you combine both, uh, probably uh, a stronger immunity. But uh, yeah, that depends on the number of exposure you have. Your immunity will 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 get that booster, and will get the booster again, and and will will become more uh, will become stronger. And the third part, uh, that one I remember, the the need for frequent uh, vaccinations or boosters in the future. That's something that we don't really know. Uh, I don't think it's going to be like uh, the influenza. It's not the same type of virus, different type of virus. Uh, the mutations on in the influenza virus are to some point more predictable than the mutations in the uh, coronavirus. Uh, so I, I, I might be wrong. I don't think we'll be ending up having a, a yearly, uh, a yearly uh, COVID uh, vaccine, but I think uh, there will be a subgroup of patients uh, that might benefit from uh, having uh, boosters. But uh, I, I will be surprised if that becomes like a universal rule for everybody. No a subgroup of patients who will benefit from it, and the, the rest of the population, uh, by completing the three-dose schedule, uh, probably will be okay. The next question. And the next question, I believe, is for Ms. Sines, and it states, um, this is from Carmina Palomar, and it states, how can we cope with all the anxieties that have come about with the pandemic? Can we help the children in our families, and or how can we help the children in our families and our communities to cope? Could you so, repeat that question? Please? Yeah, so the question is, um, how can we cope with the anxiety um, as it relates to the pandemic or post-pandemic, and how can we help our families, was that correct, and children um, in our homes um, with that anxiety? And so, you know, as, as you know, a clinician myself, and, and from what I've seen, um, even amongst my own children, my own family, um, the anxiety is definitely there. And, and for those that aren't aware, you know, or too familiar with anxiety, you know, the feelings or reoccurring thoughts of, of you know, stress and, and panic, and it can also lead to, you know, other physiological symptoms as well. Um, the way that you manage that is, is you know, there's a couple of ways. You know, first and foremost, it, it goes without saying, you know, seek professional help if you feel that you're not able to manage it on your own. Um, uh, some things that you can do, you know, strategies. Um, I, I tell a lot of people there's a lot of benefit in, in knowing what works for you or what works, you know, for your children. Um, so making sure that you can keep routines, um, try and be, and, and try and not deviate from, you know, standard routines in the home, especially now that we have been given the opportunity to almost normalize our, our lives again, you know, with children going back into schools, try and have minimal disruptions to that. Um, have conversations. I think that's an important one. Talk about it. You know, a lot of parents feel that, you know, maybe they don't want to address it. There's a, you know, misconception that if we talk about it, it's going to become worse or, um, you know, and, and that's not true. You want to have these conversations and you want to facilitate them in your homes and you want to have them and you want 
your children to know, you know, what it is that they're feeling and you want them to be able to express that. In children, you can encur encourage journaling, um, extracurricular activities really help, you know, um, to not have those idle minds. So you want to keep your children busy and engaged in, in healthy habits. Uh, you want to promote good sleeping patterns. Sleep is, is highly correlated with, you know, mental and emotional wellness. So good sleeping patterns, good eating patterns. Um, and again, at the end of the day, if you feel that the anxiety or the stress is more than what you can manage through some of these self-help techniques, uh, relaxation, you know, um, anything that you can do to, to improve your mood overall. Seek professional help. There is help available. There are counselors, there are doctors, you know, PCPs. I, I, Dr. Marisa Gomez, I, I probably, we text all the time, she'll call me. Um, many physicians, many of them um, have the best interest of their emotional and mental health wellness of their patients at heart. And so reach out to your doctors. They will connect you with someone. Reach out to counselors encourage your child to speak to the counselors in their schools. We have amazing school psychologists that are part of all of our districts. They are also available, so don't not take advantage of those resources. So just to, just to add to that, Vanessa, since you have the mic, let's talk about the educators also. There's a question, how can educators manage their stress and anxiety as workload and expectations? Uh, increase, I would use the word change, because of virtual learning and return to face-to-face -to -face, uh, learning. So I, I love this question um, because it, there's no secret um, to the fact that teachers were not immune to the psychosocial stressors that came about in the classrooms, yet every day in front of all of those little faces, they had to put on a facade that everything was okay. And, and many of them probably went home and cried, you know, uh, when the pandemic first hit and they had to go virtual and when they had to go back and, and really change the structure of everything, there is a lot of stress that comes with that type of adjustment um, and teachers are by no means immune to that. And so, Teachers, um, how can you how can you cope or what can you do? Again, there is so much benefit to creating a routine that works for you. Um, stick to those routines. Try not to deviate from them because a lot of our behaviors and thinking patterns um, are formed based off of routine and habit. And so as we begin to incorporate healthy routines into our lives, you will begin to better manage your stress and your anxiety as it relates to your workload. Um, expectations increase, and I think someone, someone mentioned that earlier um, here on the panel, that you know, the pandemic hit, I think Dr. Gomez, you mentioned the pandemic hit, and we know that it affected people, yet everyone, including children and teachers, were expected to carry on as, uh, you know, business as usual, school as usual, um, performance indicators as usual. And, and we know that, that that really is not setting realistic expectations for the teachers or for the kids. So just know that, know that, and use that to help, you know, reaffirm some of those cognitive processes that are associated with that stress um, and use that to help manage and remember, you know, take a deep breath, prioritize self-care, um, and, and don't be so hard on yourself. You know, um, other things that you can do um, is just improve your health, you know, your, your uh, healthy habits, um, physical wellness and emotional and mental wellness are directly tied to one another. So make sure that you're engaging in healthy habits. Um, you know, again, practice, you know, look up different mindfulness meditation, progressive muscle relaxation, um, all of those things, you know, they help. Uh, if, it, if it means that you need to engage yourself in, in other healthy habits, reading, taking on new hobbies, um, spending time with family, developing a support system, all of the above, do it support one another, teachers, colleagues, and, and school administrators, you know, understand this as well and support your teachers. Go ahead. I just wanted to add to that. Um, never in my career have I seen and treated so many patients from all ages um, for depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions. 
as I do now, um, children as young as 10. Um, so please go see your doctor. Everybody has forgotten their routine wellness checks. Um, children come in every year when they have their required vaccines, and that's when I usually see them. But please, it's been about three years that we're lagging behind in getting your wellness checks. Everybody needs to get one. And in, in part of your wellness, that includes your mental health. You know, there are other things, you know, there are medications that can help. It doesn't mean you're gonna have to take it forever. It may, you may not even have to take it at all, but discuss with your physician, your, your healthcare provider, if that's something that's an option for you or something that you may really need. And I have a lot of patients on current therapy and it's really made a huge impact in getting them back to a state of normalcy. So don't be afraid to seek help in that way. And, you know, I refer a lot of patients <laughs> to, you know, our counselors, our LPCs, our, all of our professionals who can help because we all need it and it's, it's important. And adding exercise is another really important thing to help with your mental health. So I'm going to stop asking questions, and I'm going to give uh, opportunity to our experts to, for last word, keeping in mind that the focus of today's conversation, what, what strategies can we use to mitigate the impact of educational and psychosocial development of students? More importantly, how can we have a normal academic year starting uh, September? Uh, so starting with Dr. Castillo. I mean, do we want to go back to normal? Were we ever <laughs> that great? It's what is normal. Uh, it'd be, it, I know, exactly. It'd be great to see some changes and in innovation since we've had this big disruption rather than just trying to revert back to where we were, you know, taking that opportunity that things were disrupted to try to shore up and fix the things we're at. But um, unfortunately, I'm not seeing the kind of resources being put into having that extra help in the schools to deal with the widespread issues. You know, we talk about access to counselors, access to therapy. There's huge waiting lists for this, honestly. Uh, and there's, there's not, uh, you can't magically make those all appear, but I'm also not seeing a tremendous shift of resources like we did uh, putting billions of dollars into staffing and in healthcare. And now when that's gone, that's all disrupted too. Uh, so I don't know if we can get back to a new normal. I, I would hope that we can look to to the leaders in in the experts in what we need. I'm not one of them uh, uh, to to try to uh, fix some of this. In terms of the public health uh, aspect and COVID in particular, uh, having ongoing infections disrupting the the day to day life obviously is something we can do about that. Which would be you know everybody being up to date on vaccines and those who are eligible for the booster getting it uh, going into the school year and into the fall. Um, and, and really hopefully people, because we're way behind, I think Dr. Melendez was really good at pointing this out, that of the people who are eligible, uh, the young students who are eligible, not a huge percentage uh, is taking advantage of the vaccine. So it's really trying to do what we can to promote that trust, and especially in the five to 11 age group um, uh, in the vaccine that'll help us have a more, less disrupted next year, next school year. Dr. Gomez? So the one constant thing that we've had during this pandemic is that there's constant change. And what we're telling you today may not be um, accurate tomorrow, um, but we just have to really, I still can't emphasize enough how important it is to go back to your wellness checks. You know, women getting mammograms, pap smears, getting all of your routine wellness checks. Um, I used to diagnose patients with cancer several every month. And during COVID, we had kind of that stopped. So I know that the cancer didn't go away. It was just the patients weren't coming in. So now we're kind of seeing people coming in at a more progressed stage. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is to just get yourself back to your routine of going to your physician, getting that health check and, and making sure your, your physical health is, is on par. Um, and then of course, going back with, with mental health. Um, so all of those things are just so important. So please seek, seek your, the help of your regular physician, uh, 
go see your doctor, get checked, um, and and make sure that your mental health, you know, go back to doing exercise too. All of that is just, just so important. Vanessa, thank you very much, Dr. Gomez. So I would advise to just take advantage of the positive changes because although we tend to focus on a lot of the negative um, that came from the pandemic because the pandemic in and of itself is negative, right, the virus, um, embrace the positive changes that have come. Take the good, you know, as Dr. Castillo said, you know, leave the bad, take the good, move forward. There may be some things that we don't want to go back to, um, and we don't have to, and embrace that. Um, as it relates to mental health, you know, you are not alone. Remember that you are not alone. There are so many individuals people, resources, uh, community organizations, support systems that are available to provide that support to you. So seek the help, you know, don't be so hard on yourself, advocate and, and normalize that it's okay to not be okay. Thank you very much, Vanessa. So human beings, if we're not able to forget, nothing would get done. We'd be partying all the time. If you don't forget, if you keep remembering that one day you're going to die, you'll be at South Padre Island all the time. So we're blessed with this capacity to think that our decisions are going to impact humanity from here to forth. But if we sometimes at late at night don't remember that we cannot forget. And so in the dawn of the moment, how can you forget intubating your sixth grade teacher? and her dying. How can you forget promising a family member that uh, you're going to tell the, uh, their mom how much he loves them with a recording? And so that you don't lie, you're opening up a bag, a body bag, and playing a recording of somebody's son to that patient. How can you not forget walking to these special cargo freezers with 70 people lying completely nude on top of each other, purple and obese, and diabetic, father on top of grandfather on top of grandson, some of which are your patients, you weren't even aware they were there. How can you not forget your uncle dying? How can you not forget both mom and dad? How can you not forget Dr. Pechero, who was with us for 50 years and passed away? How can you not forget all the nurses that we've known forever? Correct. How can you not forget that? And you know what happens? We forget. We forget. Not because we're bad, it's because it's our nature. That's our imprint. If we were not able to forget, we couldn't move on. When the question was asked about how do I deal with my child that you answered so well, the boxes are, one, do you have to recognize that what you're feeling is legitimate? Yes, it's legitimate to feel the way you feel. It's normal. Number two, it's universal. You know, when I was in the Iraqi desert after two weeks, man, I wanted to come home. The ground would shake. People were getting sniped. And I started having a panic attack, and a, a private came to me, and he said, I work at Walmart, man. You're a doctor. If I can take it, why can't you? <laughs> You're right. You're a loser. I'm not. You're right. right? So my point being is that it's a university. It's a universal humanity. So if we remember that you are universally human, if we don't forget what we've been through, I think that's, that's a really big, big thing. Number two, from a public health perspective, what is the biggest lesson that we learned? We learned many things. But what is the biggest lesson that I personally learned in the last two and a half years? And that is, we're placing our health priorities on the wrong things. We're placing them on things that are lines of services that are profitable. And we're not placing on those esoteric things like obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Do you guys know that we're number one in uh, hemodialysis per capita in the country? Number one in obesity? The national rate of access to health care is only 8 to 10 percent do not. Texas, 19. Rio Grande Valley, 40 percent of our community doesn't have access or is under access to health care. What, what, what's that all about, man? How, how can we let that happen? What happened to those of you who are listening to us in school? Who are the greatest impacted? The special need kids. Because if our children up here get sick, they're autistic, we go to our private counselors. But what about 90 percent of our population that don't have the access to go to an autistic counselor because they're not available in the community not be, and because they don't have access to them because of, of health care. They have to depend on the school districts. 
And, and because of that, don't forget, those who are listening to us, that there's been tremendous amount of funding, part of this building is, is, is a testament to that, to increase resources through the schools. So there are counselors, there are ways that you can get help if you use those school systems that you may ordinarily have. But the biggest lesson that I learned and that I feel personally responsible, and the reason I ran for Congress until I found out what? Okay, so the reason is because, I have to what? How many dead people can I buy? So the reason I ran is because I said, you know what, man? Where rubber hits the road, if you're the school teacher that's taking care of the child, if you're the counselor taking care of the child, if you're the school doctor that takes care of those folks, right? Where rubber hits the road, you have that responsibility because you know and so we need to impact those people that actually are making policy because we're just advisors to those policymakers. So those people that get elected, your representatives, they need to understand what your priorities are, wherever that may be. In my personal opinion, in our county, our priorities are health care and welfare and, and housing and, and not other social issues that are super important, I would never bring down, but not a high priority. And so with that, from a public health perspective, when I've gone around the country and around the world when I get interviewed, is that we are not putting our dollars in prevention so that when you run a marathon, you don't start that morning. So there will be other pandemics. This virus will mutate. There will be other in our lifetimes because we're a global community. It's not when or if, it's when we're gonna have another problem, hopefully not this magnitude. Are we going to be ready, and what lessons did we learn? And what we learned is we're in, we're in terrible baseline state of health, and we need to put our resources in getting our line of health so when the next time we come around, we're a lot better. And finally, Dr. Castillo and myself, our responsibility, above all, is not to just talk about it, but to actually measure what have we actually done besides talk. You know, I love to talk, right? But what have we done except talk? So HUD, for example, who is usually responsible for housing, urban development. Guess what they did? They funded a lab for us. They, they, they thought out of the box, and for once in, in their lifetime, they didn't build a building. They built a lab. They said, you know what? We think we can impact the community because we're building a lab where you can get segmentation quicker, where you can get you know, all these things. We don't have to wait to the state lab in Austin. We have real-time results, right? What else did we learn? Partner with people. Partner with private industry. UHS, don't fight with DHR, don't fight with Rio Grande Regional, partner with people for the well-being of communities, right? And so collaboration, people like us that dedicate our, our lives to public health have a measurable concrete compass that says, okay, we learned this, what are we doing about it? Well, we ha now we have a HUD-funded lab. What are we doing about long COVID? What clinics do we have? We know we need it, what have we done? And that requires collaboration from everyone in this room and from public, from government, from schools, from doctors, private, the nerds, okay? We all need to come together. And so how do you get ready for this coming year? Number one, pay attention. Get off social media. Don't listen to the real estate agent that tells you, you know, how FAMSIVAL here works. I mean, pay attention to those legitimate sources. If you're going to MD Anderson because it's the best cancer center in the world, and MD Anderson says, you need to wear masks. Ah, they don't know what they're talking about. Right? I mean, you got to be consistent. So pay attention. Follow the information. You're, you're very educated. Measure the outcomes. Impact public policy by being in people's faces that make decisions. Understand priorities and measure to see exactly what you've done. And above all, if there's one thing I think we can all agree, and if you disagree, tell me. If people, and I want to know, if people, when they leave this room in this conference, if there's one thing that we leave behind them, one thing, I would say vaccinations. Before next school year, get vaccinated. Get up to date. That's the number one thing, the number one message is get vaccinated. Not why we have it, where did it start, just get vaccinated. The mathematics is there. Would anyone disagree with that message? Yeah. Thank you very start. much. Easy. I wish next time you give me the mic before Dr. <laughs> Melendez. <Mellon. laughs> you won't get COVID. But I, I completely agree with the last 30 seconds of what you say. <laughs> Vaccination, we have the tools. There has been a misconception 
has been politicized, unfortunately. But uh, now we have the tools to try to go back to whatever we call normality. No, uh, uh, if you ask me, uh, are we going to go back to normality? Depends on the definition of normality. If the definition of normality is going back to the way we were like three years ago before the pandemic happened, uh, I don't think so. Uh, our life uh, has been changed forever. Uh, I think we'll have to deal with a new uh, normality uh, for us. Uh, but uh, in um, effort to try to get to that point, let's use the tools we have. Um, but seeing has been clearly shown to be effective and safe. So let's try to uh, take care of all those misconceptions in, in a very pacific way, try to, I mean, uh, convince people uh, with rational statements rather than uh, uh, to uh, use uh, information that we don't get from uh, uh, resources that uh, we can trust. Uh, there has been a lot of manipulation in the media, and, and sometimes we, we just uh, access that information and we, we take it for granted. So that's why we, we have a, uh, all this uh, data, uh, we have all the studies that support uh, the efficacy of vaccines and, and the safety profile. So let's, let's try to push it forward. Thank you very much. And thank you, members of the panel. Your contribution today has been enormous for our community, and we thank you for your time and for your effort. We had uh, three family phys physician docs over here, two of whom are actually health department uh, heads we had an infectious disease head of DHR Health, and we also had a mental health. And I take singular pride in exposing uh, one person who is a philosopher also among us, and that's Dr. Menendez. <laughs> so thank you very much, and thank you for the audience for being here. This was a great uh, collaboration between DHR Health, the Research Institute, and Region 1, and I hope we can continue this conversation and have a very safe new academic year when we come back. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Charity. Rowe, for helping and putting this together. If you are Good. here in person, please be sure to sign in so you can get credit. Or you can also do it remotely. The remote code is 052522. So today's date. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, just Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? Uh, four. Thank you. They're my life, man. Oh, yeah. Hey, that Thank was very sir. enjoyable, man. Yeah. Very Thank you. Thank you.